Sarah Lee. I'm a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'll be presenting some joint work with Elsie Kaiser on um, mapping language onto mental representations of object locations in transfer of possession events. All right, so I'm going to be talking about events, and events are inherently temporal in nature in that they're temporal entities, and they unfold in time. So indeed, human language has various means of encoding temporal information in linguistic descriptions of events. So we can say things like Kim is walking to the store or Kim walked to the store, where grammatical markers like the progressive ing or the simple past ed references the temporal structure of the event. It's also the case that different verbs can be used to describe events that differ in their internal temporal structure. So a walking event in principle is an event that can go on and on in time, whereas an entering event, as in Kim entered the store, is an event that has a certain endpoint in time. So in this work, we're going to be looking at two of these temporal encodings. Um, one grammatical aspect and two lexical aspects, both of which are aspectual cues, but they love, differ in terms of the level of linguistic representation. Okay, um, so as I perhaps alluded to, understanding the temporal structure of events is a central key aspect of event comprehension. So the research question that we're interested in here is how does the expression of time in language affect how we men mentally represent events online during language comprehension? And specifically, we're interested in how expressions of time affect how we understand the changes that objects undergo over time. So there's been a good deal of work showing that humans are able to um, track multiple states of objects as they undergo change. For example, in a chopping an onion event, for example, the onion goes from a whole onion to a chopped onion, and humans are able to track multiple states of these onions, and language modulates that process. Um, objects can also undergo changes in location, um, but it's perhaps less well understood how the tracking of object location is modulated by language. Um, so in this work, we conduct what we think is a first real-time investigation into how temporal or aspectual information in language affects mental representations of object location change. Okay, so as a case study, we're going to be looking at, looking at motion events. And motion events have this really interesting property of evolving through both time and space. So let me show you an example here. So what just happened is that the ball, um, which is called the figure, the moving entity, um, underwent um, change in terms of space, like on space, through the path from the source to the goal. Um, and this change happened over time and on space. Um, so they both have this temporal and spatial nature. So in this work, we um, designed a study that takes advantage of the fact that in motion events, comprehenders' understanding of the temporal structure of events can be mapped onto space in terms of the location of the moving entity, the ball, for example. So I've already talked quite a bit here, but um, the roadmap for the rest of the talk is like this. Um, I'm going to provide some background about the linguistic expressions of time, namely grammatical and lexical aspects, and then I'll move on to the research question and hypotheses, and then the experiment, and then I'll conclude. Okay, um, so first we have grammatical aspect. And in this work, we're focusing on the distinction between imperfective and perfective aspects. Um, so in one, for example, we have Liam was throwing the ball to Paige, which is an example of in, imperfective aspect. So I'm um, simplifying a lot here, but um, imperfective aspect gives us um, an ongoing event representation with focus on the ongoing development of the event. And in two, we have Liam drew the ball to Paige, which is an example of perfective aspect, which gives us a completed event representation. Um, so very roughly, um, we can say that um, this distinction between imperfective and perfective aspect um, provides information about the temporal perspective of the event from the outside. And we also have lexical aspect, which provide information about the temporal properties that are internal to the event. Um, in this work, we are going to be focusing on two subclasses of transfer of possession verbs. Um, in three, we have Liam gave the ball to Paige. So give is a verb that belongs to 
a verb type called give type verbs, unsurprising name. Um, so this verb class also includes verbs like hand and saw. Um, and the semantic property of these verbs that are relevant to our discussion is that they entail successful transfer, meaning that if Liam gave the ball to Paige, it's necessarily the case that Paige received it. Um, but in four, we have Liam drew the ball to Paige. So drew here belongs to a verb class called drew type verbs. Um, other verbs in this class include verbs like kick, roll, or fling. And these verbs, unlike give verbs, do not entail successful transfer. So what this means is that if Liam drew the ball to Paige, Paige may or may not have received it. All right, so having that background, let's move on to the research question and hypotheses. So we're interested in how these temporal properties of event descriptions affect the mental representations of object location change in transfer of possession events. Um, focusing, we're focusing on two different cues, grammatical aspect, the distinction between perfective and imperfective aspect, and lexical aspect, the distinction between give and draw type verbs. So I'm gonna present to you here um, two non-mutually exclusive hypotheses, one about the grammatical aspect and the other about lexical aspect. So according to grammatical aspect hypothesis, um, building on earlier psycholinguistic work, we hypothesize that grammatical aspect can modulate event representations that people construct. Um, so with imperfective aspect, which gives us an ongoing event representation, the hypothesis is that there may be less focus on the end point or the goal. Whereas with perfective aspect, which gives us a completed event representation, um, comprehenders may put more focus on the end point or the goal. And with regards to the lexical aspect hypothesis, again, we're hypothesizing that lexical aspect can also modulate event representations. And because give type verbs entail successful transfer, but draw type verbs don't, um, we can hypothesize that there would be more unsuccessful transfer representations with draw type verbs. So basically, um, if you have a draw type verb, um, you may, you're more likely to have a representation where the ball is still mid air or, or doesn't end up at the goal perfectly. It's still on the ground somewhere in the middle. So there may be more focus on the path with draw type verbs. All right, on to the experiment. So we designed a visual world eye tracking study. Um, thanks to Stefan, I don't have to explain what this is. Um, and our eye gaze data was collected with WebGazer, um, which is a webcam based eye tracking algorithm. Um, so all of our participants per did the experiment remotely on their own devices. And the experiment itself was posted on PCI Bex. Okay, so I'm not going to go into like a full on WebGazer tutorial here, but for those of you that are interested, this is roughly how it works. So what it does is that the algorithm uses the webcam to infer the location of your eye gaze. So what I'm doing in this video is I'm um, following the mouse with my eyes and the red dot is where the algorithm thinks my eye is. So what I'm doing is I'm following the mouse with my eyes and the red dot is where the web gazer thinks my eyes are. So it's pretty accurate. Okay, uh, moving on. So participants saw visual scenes like this while having their eyes tracked and listening to sentences like Liam was throwing the ball to Paige. On one side of the screen, we have the source character. And on the other side of the screen, we have the goal character. And the arrow that's next to Liam signals that air Liam is the source. Um, and this was explained to the participants. And the source and the goal character's positions were, of course, counterbalanced. And crucially, um, the sentence mentions the ball. So it says something like Liam was throwing the ball to Paige, but the ball was never visible on the screen. So instead, what we did is we designed a mouse click task asking people, let's imagine that we freeze the world during the moment described by the sentence. Where do you think the ball is in the scene? And participants were asked to click on a location after they're done listening to the sentence. Okay, and in terms of the auditory, the sentential stimuli, um, we manipulated grammatical aspect and verb type. 
um, grammatical aspect between imperfective and perfective. So sentences like Liam was throwing the ball versus Liam drew the ball. And roughly the prediction is that there would be more goal clicks and looks in perfective sentences than in imperfective sentences because perfective sentences give rise to completed event representations, whereas imperfective sentences give rise to ongoing event representations. Okay, and with verb type, we predict more path clicks or looks with draw verbs than with give verbs because draw type verbs do not entail successful transfer. So the ball may not end up at the goal, but is still on the path. Um, so just recapping these predictions, um, the goal area is shaded in red here. And we're predicting um, that there would be more clicks and looks on this red region with perfective sentences than with imperfective sentences. Um, and with regards to the path uh, region that's shaded in green here, we predict that there would be more path clicks and looks with draw verbs than with give verbs. Okay, so now let's look at the results. Um, so first, this is results from the grammatical aspect analysis on the goal area. Um, I'm showing you first the click data. So we see here that there are more clicks to the goal area, the sh area shaded in red with perfective sentences than with imperfective sentences um, as expected. And the eye tracking data shows the same pattern of results. So we see here um, that the perfective, um, sorry, the y-axis is the proportion of looks to the goal area. Um, the blue line is perfective, red is imperfective, and we see that the blue line is above the red um, during the VP region. So this is um, from the onset of the verb to the end of the sentence. So we see this pattern emerging um, before the end of the sentence, before they have to click. Um, so just recapping, we see that there are more goal clicks and looks in perfective than in imperfective sentences. All right, lexical aspects. So here we're analyzing looks and clicks to the path area, the area in green. Um, and again, as expected, we see that there are more clicks to the path area with draw verbs than with give verbs. Uh, eye tracking data shows similar patterns. Um, we see that during the VP, there are more looks to the path area with draw type verbs, the blue line, than give type verbs, the red line. Um, so to sum up, we see more path clicks and looks with draw type verbs than with give type verbs. Um, again, because draw type verbs do not entail successful transfer, and therefore there's more representations where the object is um, in the path. All right, I'm gonna conclude now. So we can summarize that temporal information and transfer of possession event description, namely grammatical aspect and lexical aspect, guide the mental representation of object location change. This happens both in real time and sentence finally, because um, our hypotheses are supported by both our click data and eye gaze data. Um, we offered what we believe is a first investigation into how aspectual information in event descriptions guide the object location representations in real time. Um, we conclude that language comprehension is a process that involves mapping linguistic input onto event representations, and that this process is a dynamic real-time process that happens during the unfolding of the sentence. Um, finally, some methodological notes. Um, we um, show here an experimental paradigm that uses spatial notions such as the goal, source, and the path as proxies for investigating temporal representations of events, um, which we believe can be useful for other researchers within event cognition. And finally, um, we hopefully show here that the novel webcam-based eye tracking method can provide informative data for research in psycholinguistics and also in broader cognitive science. Uh, I want to thank um, the people that helped out this study and our funding agency, NSF. And thank you for listening. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was just wondering, this is 
really cool. I, I was wondering if um, you noticed in the sort of continuous space of movement any sort of um, extra structure beyond the beyond just the sort of um, agent patient and intermediate, and specifically if there if there were any sort of you know bimodal uh, clusters around maybe maybe uh, around the agents themselves. Um, partly because I imagine like um, intuitively one might, uh, you, you could say like, oh, well, like Liam threw the ball, but the ball like fell out of his hand or something like this. And and then you kind of canceled the, um, then you have sort of a perfective reading possibly and the imperfectivity is canceled. Um, and uh, well, yeah, partly I was just wondering if, if you noticed any kind of interesting structure like that. Are you asking if I have more like continuous gradient data? Oh yeah, yeah. That or also in terms of like low high. Oh, that I had not thought about that. I I was partly thinking about um because um because with especially with the sort of lexical perfectivity, it seems like you can you can kind of cancel the or you can change the aspect by sort of adding additional words like oh I gave it to them but they didn't accept it mm. or something like this. Mm. Um and so you can kind of like go back and forth a little bit, um and those things sort of imply a narrative construction of the event that has different physical interpretations so if um so and and uh, there seem to be different ways that this could happen but um one or I, I would imagine anyway that a lot of those are especially relevant to the particular like locus of you know the body or something so um for instance if you say uh wh where is the punctual location of like liam through the ball um and you're only taking an inceptive reading of through so like the it started going and that's the end mm -hmm. of the action mm -hmm. and you're not actually interested in whether it was caught um you might say that the very end of like the you know this motion is through the ball but yeah. if you if you're interested in the locus of like the action you might be interested actually in where the you know the arm is at the highest velocity or something like this mm -hmm. um if if the the intended referent of through is the action rather than the sort of transfer event in which case it's sort of a different pragmatic like you, you yeah discourse effects you know might and of course there's none of that here but i just wonder if there was any kind of structure or continuous structure around the around the, the two different participants or stick figures yeah. yeah i'm i'm sure so this um right now the stimuli that we have is very um void of any discourse context um so we don't exactly know what kind of discourse context or you know pragmatics that are being inferred um, but I'm glad you mentioned the inceptive reading because um, if we were to look at clicks on the source, um, which is an analysis that we did, I'm just not presenting it here, um, but clicks and looks to the source area are higher in imperfective sentences than in perfective sentences as expected because imperfective sentences can also have inceptive readings. Um, so that all made sense. Um, but within those inceptive readings, like with regards to the body position or, you know, these cancellations, et cetera, um, currently with our stimuli, we don't have, you know, ways to look into that, but that would be like a good follow up to, um, to explore. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really cool method. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering about the the effect of like in other lexical aspects of the verbs and like lexical features of the verbs involved. And in particular with give, you have this thing that if you give the ball, you don't necessarily you know throw it, but you can also just walk to the person and give it to them. And that would by itself be enough to explain, for instance, why you have less pass area clicks with give because um, even if you have an imperfective uh, interpretation where you know the the ball hasn't been given yet. Uh, you might not expect it to be in the past. You might expect it to be, you know, still in Liam's hand, for instance. Um, and I was wondering whether you just looked at, you know, if just looking at the at the goal, uh, then would be maybe more reliable as a method to see if you have a perfect or imperfect interpretation, and if you see uh, also an interaction between the two types of aspects, lexical and grammatical. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so the distinction between these two verb types, um, they do differ in terms of whether they you know, entail transfer, successful transfer or not. But another semantic dimension along which they differ is that give, with give type verbs, the source and the goal have to be co-located. So if I'm giving something to you, I have to like not be here, but like be there, right? I mean, you, you could throw it, but it's, yeah, not, it's but, it's but the method is not specified at least, so. Yeah, um, so we don't know where people think the transfer is happening where with give type verbs. It could be like they meet somewhere in the middle on the path and transfer occurs or the 
source character travels all the way to the goal area to like give the ball yeah. to the other person we don't exactly know but um you make a really good point about like perhaps just analyzing the source region for the verb analysis well, as well mainly the goal actually mostly the goal because yeah the, the one thing we know for sure is that if we interpret it perfectively then the ball has to be with the goal at the end yeah no matter how we travel there and so looking only at the goal if not just for grammatical aspect but for lexical aspect also would be informative and also that way you could test if there's an interaction between the two types of aspects yeah yeah so look, looking just at the goal with the lexical aspect stuff um gives us you know analysis results that we entirely expect so there's more goal clicks and looks with give type verbs than with drove type verbs so it's along what we would expect um it's just a matter of like choosing which region to an analyze but i think oh, i think I, I might go with yeah yeah i see the issue would be that if we yeah for throw you might get a perfect understanding even if the ball doesn't reach the goal actually yeah so, yeah okay. sorry i should stop yeah yes Thank you.